2 Corinthians chapter number 8 tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. A church is always going to be known for something. I guess the question will be, what's it known for? I hope it's known for things that are in the Bible. I guess my fear is there's a lot of churches that are known for a lot of things that they shouldn't be known for. I guess you wouldn't be surprised if I told you that Elmwood Baptist Church is known for some things. It's known for its love for other churches, but it's known for its love for other people. And that that has been shown over and over and over these last many years. Not only not only within our own family of faith, but also also our missionaries around the country and around the world. A church known for something. It's mighty, mighty important. In verse number five, Second Corinthians chapter eight, it says, And this they did. Not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Let me read that again. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. The churches of Macedonia were willing to give anything for a struggling, impoverished sister church, and that sister church happened to be the church in Jerusalem. And brothers and sisters in Christ were going through tremendous things. You know, I... I, don't want to put Christy on the spot, but Christy's from an area as well as Mike and Crystal and Scott are. They're, they're from an area that gets ravaged by sometimes these hurricanes and man, tremendous devastation takes place. You know, those of us that live up here in the mountain area, we don't experience hurricanes. We experience other things, but hurricanes isn't one of them. And, uh, and it's been shared with me that, man, sometimes the flooding in these things has completely wiped out neighborhoods. And what that entails is that somebody has to open up their house and say, hey, you can come stay with us. And, you know, some of the devastation has to be, you know, so great you're thinking, well, how long are they going to stay? Well, they're going to stay because they need to stay. I've even heard of churches that have been completely wiped out. You know, what what gets involved there? Well, you know what? I'm guessing that because those churches came back that that church was known. And understand, what is a church? A church is this. A church is not this. This is a building where the church meets. This is a church. And... The church becomes known for, well, you know, our church, our building was destroyed, but our church wasn't destroyed. And so let's, let's all band together and let's, let's get a place where we can assemble together. A church known for something. The Jerusalem church was going through great, great, great persecution. And we read about it in Acts 8 and 9. But you know, uh, the churches of Macedonia were also facing their own persecutions, their own hardships. You know, you can really tell that somebody's got a heart for the Lord when in the midst of their own trial, they're willing to reach in and say, what can I do to help somebody else? That's That's quite a trait. The Bible says to us tonight that at first they gave themselves to the Lord 
And then they gave themselves to under. This is the kind of church we need. <laughs> this is the kind of church we need. Because, listen, when you give yourself to the Lord and the Lord is Lord, and the Lord gets to call the shots, well, then, of course, it's no big surprise if the Lord says, I want you to give yourself to this person or that person or that need. A church needs to be known for something. And I, I have a couple things here I want to share with you that I think a church needs to be known for. And the first thing is, a church needs to be known for its vision. You know, the reason why we can go across America and we can drive past church buildings that are vacant is because somewhere along the line the vision died. Elmwood Baptist Church didn't start out as Elmwood Baptist Church. It actually started out as Heritage Baptist Church. It started out as, a, as an outgrowth of a tent revival meeting that was held by <laughs> Dr. Ed Nelson. How many know Dr. Ed Nelson? When he preached here, and we had a meal together, and I preached with him uh, in, in other venues, we talked about Elmwood. He told me, he said, you know, Brother Randall, he said, I'm sitting right here on this platform. He leaned over, he said, I love your staff. I said, you know, I'm looking at him, he said, they dress right. This, this, you know, I mean, this guy is a warrior. I, I mean, anybody that knows about Dr. Ed Nelson knows that, man, this guy, it wasn't about talking about walking with God. It was walking with God. He was a man of great vision, I must say. But so were the people that were affected. And what started out and what was meeting in the old Ampride, the old co-op building over here, was a nucleus of people that had a vision for the Brighton area for a church. None of this existed. They were just meeting together in a rented place. But God blessed it. And the people gave, and the people were involved. And by the way, without any of that, nothing happens. In case you haven't figured it out by now, ministry costs money. They don't give tracts for free. United Power, we wish we'd get free power. But they don't. But you know something? These people, they had a vision. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18 says, where there is no vision, notice, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. He that follows God's word, he that obeys God's word, happy is that person. But it's the people who perish. Well, pastor, we're sure glad you have a vision. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm the only one? I mean, I'm a big guy, but I'm not people. I'm a person. <laughs> people is plural. Where there's no vision, the people perish. What kind of vision do you have for Elmwood Baptist Church? What do you pray about when you pray about for Elmwood Baptist Church? What do you want to see God do with Elmwood Baptist Church? Hey, what are you asking God to use you to do at Elmwood Baptist Church? Every church needs a vision. And a vision needs to include, obviously, reaching the lost. 
whether it's home or whether it's on a foreign field someplace. There needs to be a vision of what Elmwood Baptist Church can be. What can it be in your vision that God gives to you? Is there a, a, a vision to reach the people of our locality? Now you're going you're gonna to say, Pastor Randall's crazy, but I, I don't believe I am. See, I believe that there's a great crowd here tonight. Wonderful. Thank you. You have a vision for being in church, obviously. But let, let me say this. Isn't this the way it's supposed to look on Thursday night? Hey, isn't this what gate ministry is supposed to look like? Isn't, that, isn't this what gate ministry is supposed to look like? Huh? Is there a vision? Can this surrounding area be captured for Christ? Well, you know, I, 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 when the roll is called up yonder, part of that judgment is going to be, what did you do to reach your area for Christ? What did you do? Can Elmwood Baptist Church reproduce itself in another community? We planted churches in Colorado. We're praying and asking God to help us to plant another one. Can Elmwood Baptist Church reproduce itself in Aurora? Hello, can Elmwood Baptist Church reproduce itself in Aurora? Well, certainly it can. Certainly it can. What will it take? It will take vision. It will take vision. God help us to have vision for this. You know, the vast overwhelming majority of independent fundamental Baptist churches in America have never planted one church. Never have birthed one church. Never have reproduced themselves anywhere. Dr. Earl Jessup, dear, dear friend of mine who's with the Lord now, back in 1994, he and I were preaching in a in a church planting conference together. Dr. Ed Johnson from First Baptist Church in Rosemont, Minnesota, who's with the Lord now. Dr. Earl Jessup, founder of Baptist Church Planting Ministries. And Gary Randall. And I knew it was important for churches to be started. In fact, that year, that year as a pastor... I led, the, I led our church in Montana to plant our very first church. A church that exists today, has their own building, their own property, in Dillon, Montana. Dr. Earl Jessup and I got to be very, very close friends. And I can tell you that he took the Word of God because I asked him, I, I didn't understand about faith promise missions, and I didn't understand about what is the biblical method for church planting. And I had him preach several missions conferences. In fact, he preached several missions conferences right here at Elmwood Baptist Church. And early on, we sat down together and he opened up the Bible. We opened up our Bibles together. And he taught this preacher, here's what faith promise missions looks like in the Bible. And Brother Randall, here is how God wants churches to be planted. And I caught it. I saw it. And, and I thought, wow, this is remarkable. Well, really, it's not that remarkable. It's called the Great Commission. You see, you go out and you win them to Christ. 
that, that it says, go out and teach all nations, but that word teach, that, that particular word, metatheo, means to reach them for Christ. It means to bring them to the Lord. And then it says, and baptize them. Baptize them. Why? Because they need to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the Savior that they just took in as their Savior, they need to identify. Hey, listen, I think wedding rings are important. I do. And, and, but I'm not married to this ring. I wear this ring because I'm married. I'm identified with Betty Randall. She bought this ring for me from Zales Jewelry, or for me, in 1972. It cost 19 bucks. I still have the receipt. Baptism is an identification. We're going to have a couple ladies get baptized tonight. I think it's important. God thinks it's important. Since, 19, since 2004, Elmwood Baptist Church has planted seven churches. Now, we committed ourselves to seven churches. Five of those churches are still functioning. Two of them no longer in, in existence. Not, not because we didn't put in the effort but because Satan got in and sowed sin. We're going to do it again, Lord willing. And you know how? As a church. As a church. We're going to get behind this couple, and we're going to go to another community, and by the grace of God, we'll see another church planted not so we can beat our chest and, and say, boy, look at us. <laughs> no, no. No, it's because that community is big and it needs 10 independent Baptist churches, but we're going to get one going. And that takes vision. And without it, we perish. If all we can see is what right is, is what right in front of us, then we're done. And secondly, a church must be known for her compassion. We have to have compassion. In Jude, in verse 21, 22, and 23, it says, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, Making a difference. <laughs> Isn't that what we want to do? We want to make a difference, don't we? And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. We've got to have compassion. Does it bother you that someone you know is going to hell? If it doesn't bother you, can I tell you that Maybe during the invitation today, tonight, you, you, you find a place either at your seat or you find a place at this old-fashioned altar and you beg God to give you compassion. Because somewhere, my friends, somewhere along the line, you lost your compassion. Acts chapter 20, verse 31, it says, Therefore watch and remember... That by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. That was, the, that was the missionary work of the Apostle Paul. Night and day. And by the way, he still had to go to work. And he did it all with tears. We need compassion for our area, amen? And Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, but when they saw the multitude, when he saw the multitude, speaking of the Lord, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted 
and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. We need to have churches because people need a pastor. I know that sounds horribly self-serving. I don't mean it to be that way. I really don't. But our Heavenly Father has said it's important that I have under shepherds down here pastoring the flock of God. My judgment's different than your judgment, beloved. Because I'll give an account for Gary Randall, but I'll give an account for every ministry I've been involved in. And this ministry is a ministry I'll get involved in. I mean, listen, everything we do, the music ministry is my ministry. The youth ministry is my ministry. Uh, God is going to hold others who are involved in those ministries accountable for whatever they do, but God's going to hold me accountable for the whole entirety of the ministry. That's why I'm kind of particular about the way things are done. You know, I said to deacons many, many years ago, as long as I'm the one who has to give the final account, I'll have the one, I'll be the one that has the final say. Our deacons are right on board with that. I'm not a dictator. I just know what the Lord requires. We got to have compassion. We got to love one another. We have to watch out for one another. We got to care for one another. We have to care for not only those that are part of our church family, but we got to go outside these walls and we got to care for some people who maybe nobody else cares for. We have a young man in our church by the name of Josh Fuller. I don't see Josh here tonight, but typically he is here. I was talking to Josh one time, and I asked him, I said, so Josh, what does the Lord have you doing? And he told me, he said, you know, Pastor, he said, I give away socks. I said, really, tell me about it. He said, well, really nothing to it. He said, I just... He said, I just get a bunch of socks together and I go down on Skid Row down there in Denver where all the homeless are and where all the encampments are and where, by the way, nobody else wants to go. And he said, I go down there and I just hand out socks. I read somewhere after I talked to Josh that, that socks is the most asked for thing by people who are in dire straits and go to places to get some help. Uh, the, the number one thing that they ask for is socks. Well, Josh knows from whence he came. He's been through some things in his life. He knows exactly what that looks like. He knows exactly what that feels like. And the Lord saved him, brother Terry had the joy of leading him to Christ in the jail ministry. And we hope to have our jail ministry up and going somewhere. But you know something? The Lord's done a remarkable thing in that young man. Hold on to your horses. I'm going to be having him preach here uh, sometime soon. I can't hardly wait to hear that first message. <laughs> but he has compassion. He didn't just get saved and moved on. He got saved and he started thinking about a bunch of people. And you know what? He probably knows a bunch of these people that he's given socks to. I thought, man, what can I do to help with socks? And, you know, so don't be surprised. I mean, Pastor Randall's always thinking about something. It might be a little crazy. But I thought, maybe I need to get a big barrel around here somewhere and put socks on it. And just ask people, listen, why don't, why don't you go pick up a pair of socks and bring it to church, throw it in the barrel? Wouldn't it be something if we gave Josh... A whole big barrel full of socks. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, I love it. I love it. But just that a church needs to be known for her compassion. Church needs to be thirdly known for her altar. You know, altars are being forgotten. The altar is where we offer ourselves. That's what Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice. Dead sacrifices can't do anything. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's not Medal of Honor Christian service. That's reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Is there a Christian in this room that does not want to be in the center of God's perfect will for your life? Well, listen, there it is right there. There's the prescription. There's how it's done right there, right there. You take those two verses, and there it is. And what's that all about? It's, an, it's all about an altar. An altar is where you go and you offer yourself. An altar speaks of confession. An altar speaks of getting things and making things right with God. An altar is a place where tears are spilt. An an altar is, is where we find the will of God many times. <laughs> an altar speaks of surrender. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. An altar. Fourthly, a church must be known for her commission. I know I've touched on this already, but here I am again. There's only two reasons why a church exists. And that is to gather in and to send out. And that's it. We're not down here. Listen, Elmwood doesn't exist so that we can have uh, a big giant Baptist social club. That's not why it's here. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, again the Bible says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's the gathering in, beloved. And then beginning in verse number 20, it says, Teaching them, didaskalos, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded thee, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That's the sending out. That's the sending out. How a church begins will in large measure set the course for how that church continues. 21 years ago, God had a vision for Elmwood Baptist Church. I had no idea what God was going to do, but I did know this. That Betty and I had, in this little old motel over here, we had arrived at the conclusion, the understanding, the complete knowledge that this was exactly where God wanted us. And however God was going to use us, we were just surrendered to, Lord, whatever it is. As you hear Paul Schwanke say, my life for your will. That's something that needs to be said often at an altar. My life for your will. You know, that's good for every area of your life, no matter what it is. So we're back to 2 Corinthians 8.5. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. Maybe that has to happen tonight. And then unto us by the will of God. 
Heavenly Father, I pray tonight.